Yeah, so when we grow our fields, what we are trying to do is uh, make this organic uh, circle in everything we are, we are doing. So we're not using artificial fertilizers, we're not using uh, uh, pesticides, and it means we have to change the crops every year. So in all of those 500 hectares of land, they are quite close. They are within eight kilometers, all of them, from our farm. Maybe nine from the furthest, furthest one. Um, and we change the crops every year. Probably two years with clover grass, which we will harvest for our cows so they will graze it. Um, this is also really good for building up the nutrition in the soil because the clover in the grass will pick up nitrogen from the air, put that into the soil, it will build up nutrition. And that's actually what you need for your grain crop afterwards. So when we plow uh, up you know, the, 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 the grass fields, we will have maybe three, four years of really good uh, grain, uh, grain growing. Um, probably the first year should never be barley because there's uh, some kind of insects that will ruin your barley field. So you, you, we use that for wheat or spelt or oats, and then there's a really good year for barley. And then you have another year that shouldn't be barley because then you have the same wheat growing from last year. So probably rye would be really good because it's a winter crop, so it covers the field quite early and it competes uh, with the wheat very differently. And then the fourth year, you could have a barley year again, or sometimes we put in like um, some kind of beans, normally used for feed actually for the cows. But again, it's a bean. It also brings up nitrogen in the soil. It builds up nutrition. And then you could actually have another year of barley in the end and then go back to grass. Okay. So it's a very long term planning what yeah. Marie is doing today, <laughs> yeah. because you, you have to think of every field in a seven year cycle and they would be in different positions in that cycle. So it's always a big puzzle to make that happen. But when you do it right and you don't try to cut corners, you can, you can actually get really high quality and really good yields, really healthy grains. And then you just have to be very careful about when, when you harvest, not wait too long, of course not too early, um, and bring it in and have the infrastructure at, at, the, at your farm to dry down the grains immediately to make sure there's no fungus growing there or insects eating up the grains. And that will happen very fast if you have too much moisture in the grain at harvest, which you always have in Denmark. Uh, this year was an exception, like one in 40 years where you don't have to dry down the grains because you had a drought uh, in late summer. Mm. You just but, mentioned 500 hectares. Is that yeah. your land or is it the entire area? Sure. No, so it's 500 hectares is the land that we grow. Okay. Oh. So that's what we, uh, we don't own every single hectare. Much? Yeah. But it's, it's, it's for a Danish farm that's um, like medium large sized, I think. You would have some that are much, much bigger, but also some that are smaller. Some that are focusing on just milk production would maybe only have 150 to 200 hectares. But I think Danish farms are quite bigger than you would see in, in many countries. But that's just how it is, I guess, yeah. And how long can you store the grain? So you can store it for a long time. Yeah. We, for malting, you really don't want to store it much more than one to two years. Yeah. Um, uh, you need a very high uh, you know, germination rate yeah. when you start malting. Yeah. And that will decrease in time. Okay. But if you store it dry and cool, it can stay for a very long time. Yeah. But it's hard in summer if it's very hot. <clears throat> Everything is heating up. So you can never have a summer at 10 degrees in the, in the grain. So you, you don't want to store it for much more than one summer until the next, okay. the next one. Okay. Yeah. Um, but this is where that, that happens and we just, you know, when you have the cows here, the cows are not making whiskey, obviously, uh, that would be very easy, but, uh, uh, but, but they are part of the cycle because every, every byproduct that we get, the, the draft from the brewing uh, of the wort for, for our whiskey goes back as feed for the cows. Uh, the cows manure, of course, is what we can actually fertilize our fields with um, and even, even the pot ale that we have are used in the feed. It has more nutrition and tastes better for a cow than water. And you have to bring in some water in the feed to get the right mix. So we try to use everything that we can again. If we have any kind of waste product, like um, uh, from, from malting, when you flush out uh, the water from, from the first steep, that water will actually just be sprayed on the fields because it has some nutrition there. 
And in a city, this would be wastewater. You have to treat it in a water treatment plant before you let it out in, a, in the sea or in a lake or whatever it is. But here, this is, you know, it's meant to go to the field again <clears throat> to keep the nutrition in the circle. So this is, this, for us, it, ma it makes a lot of sense to think about this, um, this circular economy here because it, it keeps things where they're supposed to be. <laughs> like a nutrition back to the soil. Um, of course, we have to bring something in and let the biology work because everything we take out, a bottle of whiskey or a, a bread, you know, that doesn't actually come back because our um, manure <laughs> doesn't go back to the fields because we, we eat too much uh, medicine and everything else. Uh, so it's a very bad idea to put that on a field, mm -hmm. especially an organic field. But anyways. So I, I think we'll like skip skip looking uh, seeing all the cows, but um, this is these are some of the old buildings uh, that you saw from the courtyard, and this is the old barn, <coughs> and the old cow stables are in here, and uh, we use these now as in winter, you know they are we need room for all the animals, so they will be in here. Uh, so in summer we don't we don't use this for animals, and here is. Uh, is where our cows they uh, give birth so this is where they have a calf and uh, i'm not sure there's anyone right now but we will have i think one is the one at the bottom is actually giving birth right now so maybe, maybe uh, later we can see the newborn calf um but if you have 200 cows you get 200 calves every year yeah 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 and they live over there in the in the stable but this is um this is the old building that was built for cows. So it would probably back then have been 32 cows here. That would be what the, the farm was living off. Um, and I think these buildings are amazing. Like if you, you would never have the money to build something like this for 30 cows <laughs> today, that would be crazy to think. But uh, back then, you know, it, it had higher value per, per unit, I guess. So this was what, what the heart of the farm even back then. Um, and I think if, if there's any time in the future where, uh, where the, the cows don't need that much room, we can probably figure out a way to drink some whiskey in here or something like that. Uh, so these are very, you know, it has a lot of tradition, these buildings, not from whiskey, but it has a history from uh, what was happening here in, at that time. And, and even though it's not directly whiskey related in that sense, uh, for, to me, it still makes sense to use the old buildings here and the surroundings that's been here for hundreds of years uh, and use that for the setting for the distillery and everything that we're doing. So we're cleaning up... Uh, this is a uh, rye that are getting cleaned up now um, for a batch of rye mold. And uh, I think most of this is actually going to be turned into rye bread at a bakery here in Denmark. So we're doing a batch for them. So you don't use all your grains for your whiskey? You can uh, sure. yeah. share with the brewers, the bakers? Yeah, exactly. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about it, but yeah. And this is a very clever setup. So it starts up here, where you have uh, the grain coming in. Uh, you have a suction of air, so if there's any dust, it goes away. It comes to a sorter, uh, so it's like, um, uh, takes away the big, ch big chunks and the smallest chunks. So if you have any, like basically everything that's too small or too big to be a grain, that will be sorted away. Then you have two round sorters here that will take away like your broken kernels, like half, like round kernels, but also long kernels in those two machines. And then it ends up down here on the sorting table. That will throw the grain in one direction and then it blows the grain in the other direction. And that means that uh, if you see that it's getting thrown this way and blown that way. So if you look over here, see these are all the light, the light components here. 
So all the husks that are in here or something that's broken down, that will get sorted away. And we take the section to the right, that will be sorted away as, as waste or feed for the cows. While here in the middle section, you see this is beautiful, clean, dry. There's nothing in here you don't want to eat. And this is very necessary to make great molds. You would need to clean it up really properly. And this is a, it's, it's very important this, that if you don't, if you have a dirty raw material here, you will not get great barley out of it, great barley mold. So right now we are smoking molds. Um, and this is the fireplace. <laughs> we have a smoke generator. We've been using that before. Very dirty. It, it gets really dirty when you're smoking. Um, but now we are basically using this. Um, and it's a quite simple setup. It's, uh, it's a fireplace. Um, when we need to light it up, we put in these, uh, these uh, uh, electric heaters and it makes everything smoke as much as we can. We don't want fire, just, uh, just smoke. So, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of wood chips in here, and we're just it's still lighting up for the morning, sure. Uh, but we try to get as much smoke as we can. It can it it will be more than this uh, when this is getting going again. So which wood are you using there? So this is beech wood for our beech wood smoke. Hi Klaus. Hi. That's our. Uh, uh, smoke, smoke master, maltster. Der kommer lidt, lidt mere træ i den her gang. Ja. <laughs> Det gør vi også. So this is where the chips are. I can just show you the smoke. So this is how the smoke looks like. So if you open this one, you see it's it's quite smoky in here, and uh, and the smoke will be drawn. This, this is to make sure there's no sparks coming up and lighting up the chimney. We don't want that. Um, so this will uh, suck in um, uh, the smoke and into the, into the molten drum. Yeah, so this is our distillery and, uh, and malt house. Um, and we basically built this up from, from, from the ground. I think in the beginning we started brewing in the place we, we came in, in the, in the old horse stables, in a very simple system, but we uh, improved the system and it's the same thing here. So this is quite handheld. We're not brewing today because there's, um, uh, uh, I think the plate cooler broke down yesterday, so we have to fix it this afternoon, hopefully, so we can get brewing again tomorrow. But the distilling is going on. Um, so we'll look at that in a moment, uh, but we'll just start with, uh, with the malt house. Um, so we have three malting drums now. Um, this is the newest one. <coughs> and um, the way the malting process is working is that we uh, s clean some grains, like we just saw. We'll put them in one of the silos out back. And then we will fill the steep tank, which is, uh, which is this tank on, on the back here. This fits one... Um, Let's say like six tons of barley from the storage, along with seven to eight thousand liters of water. And that's going to steep for maybe 12 hours. Then we'll drain away the water. That will clean out the grains a bit, and we need to let the grains rest to let it breathe. Because if you keep it under water for a long time, you will actually drown the grain, and the germination process will be ruined. Um, so we want to give it a rest. Then for another 18 hours or something, it will be resting, and then we add water again and steep it for another six to eight hours normally until we have around 45% moisture inside the kernel. So the grains at that point will be quite large. You can see there's some, um, it's not quite wet, but there was sorted out here. You see this is uh, already, uh, you can see the, the rootlets coming out here. Um, mm -hmm. These are just here because we have this ring on top. So if you have foaming or you have like, a, we aerate uh, the water and the barley during, during the steep process, it will be spraying a bit. You will have some of the kernels jumping over the side. So some a small portion ends down here. So you can see it's already starting. This is just one and a half days in 
after we wet it, but now the rootlets are, are already quite clear here. Mm -hmm. Normally we, we transfer it before the rootlets are here, but this one has it's just been staying down here for another few hours and it goes uh, that fast. Right, it's really, really fast. So in, in two days you have this would be the stage after around two days of the barley after we start steeping. So it's really, really fast that everything gets going. Okay. So the germination doesn't start in the germination floor. It starts in the steep quite fast. And you will see the respiration going on. <clears throat> so the moment you, you start, uh, the moment you start steeping, it will actually take up oxygen to kickstart the, the germination process. So that's why you, if you keep the grains in the water, in a very short time, there will be no oxygen left, and that will kill the grains. That's why you need to aerate during it, um, during germination or during steep. A quite large centrifugal pump. We add a bit more water that we inject, so we know it's wet enough. And that pump will actually push <coughs> grains and water through this pipe. It's right up here. <coughs> And then we put on a hose. I actually don't know where the hose is. I think it's down here. But like a, a hose like this. And we open up one of the top hatches of the drums, the drum that we want to move it in. Turn on the pump and we, uh, we have a chance to play fire brigade for uh, half an hour or something until the grain is transferred. And these drum are made in, drums are made in a way that we want to do the germination in here and the kilning in here. So germination is about letting the biology happen. We want the germination to, to progress for at least three, four, five days, depending on the grain and the temperature. Um, in the beginning, when we put the grains in, it's in a heap. We need it to flatten it out. But these drums are made so we can rotate the whole drum. So it will turn all the way around. Uh, when we move out here, we can set, set you, you, can, you can see how that's happening. Um, and uh, we do that a few times, and everything is, is evened out in there. OK, so if you look in here, this is a, we'll try to look here as well. You see the smoke is coming in here. Yeah. <coughs> uh, and it's, uh, it's just a, a, a breeze that will suck this smoke through the grains here. Oh, OK. Right? So it's, it's not coming out here too much, at least. Yeah. But there's a cavity down here, yeah. so we can push in air. Yeah. Um, and then you have the malting floor up here. So we have the beams carrying the floor. Yeah. There's holes in that. And you have the, the grains lying here on top of this. Yeah. This is a half batch, or a bit less, because we're testing smoking on this one. Uh, the other drums are, uh, uh, like that, that's the full batch over here. Okay. Um, and then when we rotate, uh, the grains will fall over, find a new position. We do that three times a day during germination. And then we, um, then we, it settles in a new position, so everything is loose and nice. Because if you let it stay, if you let the grain stay for four or five days in germination without moving it around, it will be one big brick, and the air can't be pushed through anymore. So this is the one that was transferred to this drum. Over here, you have uh, a drum being emptied at infinity, you know? Yeah. So the way we empty out the drum is that we uh, turn it upside down, and then, then we have an auger here that can move out the grains. In the top, there's, there's just a floor in the bottom, so the top is just open. So when we move it up, now the grains are lying here, something like, uh, like this, inside the drum. And we can take it out, and we'll take this uh, big a straw, basically, and this we uh, attach this to a pneumatic transport, so it sucks and blows, and this will suck the grains away and blow it into one of the silos over here. So that's the whole that's the whole idea. Uh, before it goes to the silo, we will clean out the grains in a in a cleaner again to get the rootlets away, because the rootlets the rootlets are very high protein, and that will give you some unwanted flavors in beer and, and, and also in your whiskey. Uh, you don't have to take it away. You can also keep them and use that as a flavor, I guess. But normally, it's, you don't want it, so you clean away the rootlets. And they're very high protein, so for us it's great because the cows need high protein feed. So it's the most amazing byproduct that we have is actually these rootlets from the barley.
And when you put in six tons of barley in one malting drum, we'll end up with around uh, five tons of finished malts. So there will be a loss of 17, 18 percent. Um, part of that is, is, is water, because we start with 14 percent water, but we end up around 5 percent. So we dry it down a lot in the end. Um, and the rest is just germination, so there's respiration going on. So the last part of the, of the process in here, after, after germination, is kilning. So what's happening over here with the smoking in that drum is that it's, um, it's, uh, it's kilning. Uh, well, the kilning will start actually after the smoking, mostly. So we are just pre-kilning right now and smoking the grains. And during, uh, during kilning, we want to dry down the grains fast. That will stop germination. So we will keep the grains in the state where we want it. We will let it germinate until we know that the cellular structure is broken down and we have the modification of the kernel that we want, where we know that starches are made into sugars. We need those sugars to be able to create alcohol afterwards. So we just keep the germination going. And now, just pre-kilning, just a, you know, late in germination process, we'll start the smoking. This is our brewery, and it's not very large. This is a 1,000 liter uh, mash tun. Um, but we can do a lot of quick brews in this one. It takes three hours to finish one brew. So since our still is also 1,000 liters, this is a, a one batch match for the distillery. So it is quite small, but we just try to do it a, a lot of times instead. Um, so 240 liters of uh, kilos of malt, 1,000 liters of water, maybe 1,200. Um, you start with part of the water, try to hit 64 degrees. Let it stir around. We call that mashing. Yeah, that's a, like, that's an org, uh, like an, uh, ah, yeah. you have one here, right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> just rotating device so you don't have to do it by hand. But basically, it just has to stay at that temperature in water for 45 minutes. And during that time, the enzymes, the alpha amylase and beta amylase, will, uh, will take the dextrin, the sugars in the, in the malt, and cut it up. One of those enzymes cut it from the ends, the molecule, and the other one cuts it in the middle. And you will end up with maltose, this very simple sugar. And this is the kind of sugar that yeast eats and creates alcohol out of. So this is what you want to happen. And you need that temperature. Between 63 and 65 degrees would all be OK. But we aim for the higher uh, end of that, because it gives a bit more extract. How do you control it, the temperature? Yeah, so in the pre-mixer pre up here, we, can, we have a mixing system with the water, so we can decide on the temperature of the water coming in. So we mix hot water and cold water. Mm -hmm. um, the hot water actually comes from a tank that's outside in, in a room out here. And that water is created in the stills, so the cooling water is heated up to 80 degrees. I will tell you about this in a moment. So we have 80 degrees hot water sitting there, along with cold water that we can mix in. And what we actually want to mix is a temperature around 71, 71.5 degrees. If we do that in the mixer, it will be 64 and a half here. 64 degrees, something like that would be what we normally do. So we have the hot water we need just, just from the stills. We don't we have the chance to heat up, reheat the water if it gets too cold. But apart from that, we don't heat water for brewing. We just take the, the water from, from the stills. That's recycling energy as good as we can. <clears throat> so we will spend some time in the bottom of this. This is another sieve with holes in it. So the bottom is, is a big sieve. And we can, uh, when you open this uh, valve, out comes the water, but the grain stays in. And we'll sparge more water. So we do this traditional sparging, like you do in brewing, um, where we just add more hot water to the top of the grains. So when, it, when you see the, the, the grains are now dry on top because you had the water sieved through, you'll add more hot water and do it again and again, as hot as possible to extract as much sugar as we can and as much flavor as we can. The enzyme process is all done within the first 45 minutes. So the rest is just about flushing out the sugars and the flavors, actually. We normally take it to this bin, and then we find, um, 
we'll come to the distillery in a moment, but we'll just find a, an IBC like this. <coughs> so for, for the brewing process, um, yeah. what, what kind of yeast do you use? Yeah, sure. I can just show you the yeast. Uh, these are empty. Uh, I think we need to go to one of the taller ones here. <coughs> We can find a, a stool or something. Just a moment. I'll just find a small S stool. S is what's the S fold? U. So if you want to have a look, you can uh, climb the stairs and uh, and you'll have a better chance. <coughs> No, no, I'm, I'm tall enough. Okay. You must have a promising basketball team. Yeah, sure. And uh, Klaus that we hired, the guy in the malt, so he's as tall as I am. <laughs> so you see now the, now the, the wort is fermenting. Yeah. Uh, this is from probably from yesterday. And you see it bubbling. You can smell the, the CO2 and all the grain flavors here. And that's just a yeast that's eating the sugars now, and it creates CO2 as a byproduct, and also alcohol as a byproduct. So the reason it's bubbling is the CO2 that's bubbling up here. <clears throat> Actually, have you can taste it in a moment. <laughs> this is quite active right now because it's uh, newly brewed, and there's a lot of sugars in there, so the yeast is having a party. Yeah. But at the end, this 1,000 liters of water will be at around 8 to 9% alcohol. So quite strong beer that we will distill into whiskey. How long do you let it ferment? <clears throat> so basically, the production of alcohol is done within three to four days. But we normally let it ferment for something like five to six days. Uh, we don't work in weekends. Oh, yeah, sure. So we'll uh, make sure that. Uh, you know, it, 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 it depends. It could actually be four to six days as it is right now. On Monday, we'll brew something that we will distill on Friday. But what we distill on Monday will be from Tuesday. So that will be six days. So it, it depends on where we are in the week. Um, but a quite long fermentation for a whiskey distillery. Mm. Quite long. For us, it started as a, just the most practical method because we would brew one week and we'd distill that next week. Time for a beer, I think. <laughs> so this is a sweet wort. It's from yesterday, but I think it should still be fine. You know, if you let it stay long enough, we don't boil it. So if you let it stay long enough, there will always be uh, natural yeast and bacteria around. Mm -hmm. But it should be fine. It's from yesterday. You can, uh, you can try that. And this is... Uh, almost fermented <laughs> uh, wort. And this is from the, I'm actually quite looking forward to this because I didn't taste the fermented version yet. Um, we just started um, brewing and distilling later this week. Um, the first batch of smoke from the new system out here. So this is it. So I, I, I haven't uh, tried this yet. You see there's like a, the, the yeast, the rest of the yeast are sitting in the in the bottom of the, of the, of the bottle here. Yeah, yeah. And if you let it stay long enough, after there's no sugars left, if you go for like one or two days, everything will be at the bottom and the water will be clear. But since it's still active, it's still in in the liquid and it's not until it had like two days to, to go into uh, hibernation that it actually uh, drops down to the bottom. So you can try it out. This is a sweet wort. This is basically grain juice. No alcohol in this one. Sorry about that, Peter. No. <laughs> yeah. Getreidewasser. Yeah, Getreidewasser. <laughs> we call this a sweet wort or süßes, what heißt wort? What, what's, what's that in German? Würze. Würze. Yeah. This is before you add yeast, before you ferment it. This is how the extract from the grains will uh, taste like. And this is a slightly smoked. It's not heavily smoked, but it's slightly smoked. You can definitely smell it. Sure. Actually, it's not going through Bamberg, right? 
So have a, the smoke is a bit different, but it's 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 a bit like this, the Schlenkerle Rauchbier. If you add some, um, there is a familiarity. Yeah. I'm thinking about honey glazed bacon. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. There's this really intense sweetness to the smoke as well, and also because there's so much sugar in this right now. So you can try the fermented version here. Yeah, so this is um, after fermentation. Oh. There's still, you can still smell the yeasty flavor on this one because it's so fresh. But you feel now the, the, the sweetness is gone. It's beer. Now it's beer. Okay. There's no bubbles, there's no hops. But it's dry now, it should be dry. Yeah. Mm. Like I would, um, from the batch, I would say maybe this one maybe 7.5 to 8 percent for this batch, and you can you can taste the alcohol. Mm. It's, it's quite there. Oh, you're trusting a German company mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. distilling. Yeah. But it has this, like some of the things um, that you said, uh, Bernard, yesterday, that you could have that citrusy aroma in there and this grainy feeling, like almost like dough-like grain malt feeling. It's actually here as well. There's a lot of like citrusy flavor in this in this brew from the grain, actually, the, the way the grain is. And, uh, and, uh, and you have that really malty grain feeling to it. It's quite a no. It is quite a like a pilsner-like malt, just smoked. But there's a lot of flavor to this, a lot of sweetness to it, a lot of malty character to this. Should, in my opinion, you shouldn't drink too much of it because it really makes you go to the loo. <laughs> <laughs> sure, if when there's still yeast in it, I mean that's the problem. If you waited for two days, you could you could drink as much as you wanted. Um, but sometimes you, you're told that you know this doesn't taste really good. But I think this is, uh, I, I think this is excellent. I mean, yeah, it's not a finished beer. You need to do other things if you want to finish it as a beer. But I, I love the aroma and the smell. Well, you have to get used to that um, sweet and sour. Yeah. That, that you experience. Not everybody sure. likes that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I had worse. I, I had worse beer. Like, you can, <laughs> but you can also get better ones, right? Okay. So, um, so this is a distillery, and this setup is uh, part traditional and part not traditional at all. <coughs> this is basically a pot still. So this is a copper pot, 1,000 liter liters fits in, and um, it's made of basically just a pot. This is a steam jacket. So you put in steam that will heat up the pot. After one hour, it will start to boil. Um, the vapors that arises here are very condensed in alcohol because the alcohol evaporates easier than water. So maybe there's even 50, 60 percent or something like that alcohol in the vapors. It moves up through the hat and the neck. Um, and I think if it, this was a traditional Scottish pot still, it would go straight to the condenser, actually, here. Because this one is full with cold water on one side, and then you have pipes where the vapors can be pushed down through, and it will touch the cold sides where the water is on the, on the back, and that will make everything into spirit. So you can try if you want. We are in Denmark. You can try and, um, and uh, smell this and taste this. You take it from, yeah, there or from the stream, yeah. And this is quite high in alcohol, I would say. Uh, we, we can try to measure it, but this is around, still around at least 80% right now, I think. But you don't, like, just what you have on your finger is so little that you can actually still uh, experience what, what kind of flavor it is. Yeah. So this is a Danish spirit safe. Yeah, <laughs> and, it, and it's very safe, as you can see. Don't you tell anyone. <laughs> So this is still 81.5 at this point. <clears throat> I mean, it's funny as to say uh, this is probably not. Um, this is probably the first of the uh, of the run. So you can try that as, uh, if you want. You can try this as well. But maybe it's poisonous. Uh, not poisonous, but you still have some acetone and some other aromas in here. 
äh, Obstler oder auch immer, wie voll. Das ist ja eine Fruchtester, die du da drin hast. Genau, ja. Yeah. And what you taste, like you say, what you taste, like the feeling, you have this, it's quite oily, actually. Yeah. You have an oily feeling on this, even though it's 80%. And, it's uh, no, it's, it's quite sweet right now. And the, right now, uh, like when you distill, what, the first aromas that, that comes through would be like very citrusy, very light, fruity aromas, like uh, some like flowers as well, but mostly like citrusy aromas, light fruit. Then it turns into, uh, more like um, um, a slight hit of licorice coming through. And then you come into like maybe bread, biscuit kind of flavors and nuts, but also some more like boiled fruits on the way. This is in, in I think here we are in, you know, it's not so fresh fruit citrus anymore. It's more like just mellow, sweet fruit. And at some point it will turn into maybe coconut and it gets heavier and heavier. So, so you have different flavors coming through in distillation all the time. And the first that comes up will be heavy in, uh, in, uh, in acetone and uh, methanol as well. So you need to take that away. So that's the heads that we cut. And the tails are when the fuselage oils are getting too heavy. So you have this really, really, really dense, almost like old meat or something kind of flavor to it. And so you don't really, or harsh margarine or something like that. So that, that you don't want that for your whiskey either. But not, right now we're just picking up this kind of singular flavor of the, of the spirit right now. Mm -hmm. But that will, that will combine with all the other flavors during this two and a half, three hours distillation when we collect the hearts. So this is quite simple. It's quite easy, drink, drinkable this, I think. But the, it should be more complex, the, collect, the full collection that we do from one um, distillation. Yeah, sorry? 80% yeah. against Yeah, yeah, and I'm going to try something with you because that's exactly what we thought. Um, and during Corona, we thought we, we, you know, we have to taste something and do something, but... Um, so what we did was we, we started doing this. Um, okay, so, said, so the first part that comes through is the heads. Mm -hmm. uh, so we use it as, as like a hand sanitizer, mm -hmm. right? So you don't, you don't drink it, you just wash your hands with it. And, you, and then try to you just smell it immediately and then just uh, wash, wash your hands, uh, smear it out, and then try to smell it again after a few seconds. And it gets really fruity, I think. In the beginning, it's quite like a chemical almost in like flavor. Like glue. A glue yeah. or like a paint bucket yeah. or something like that. But then after a few seconds, this evaporates because acetone is gone immediately. And then you have quite fruity aromas here. Yeah. That apple, yeah. the apple and some citrusy things. Maybe even like peach or like all these. Like, peach, yeah. 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 Um, and then we uh, we have the hearts. Ties all day. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the hearts of the distillation. So this is a uh, this is uh, I think it's I'm not sure if this is a collection or a one one point e extract. I'm not totally sure. Um, grainy. But this is a more grainy, more rich um, in flavor. Yeah. You can really feel. Waffles. Yeah. Like this is much more complex. Like the, the, the fruitiness of the first from, from the, the heads yeah. was so nice. But I'm, I'm not sure it would be that interesting as a whiskey. But this has some very heavy oils, but also some lighter oils, some sweetness, some graininess, some cereal. There's a lot of things going on here. And then you can try this. So this is a this is a tail section. You can see this is even really really cloudy in here, and that's because the alcohol level is decreasing. This is only 24 percent now, and these oils are quite heavy. Um, so they, they are still sweet to some degree, grainy and sweet, but they are also very heavy, and they will sit on your hands for the whole day. Um, <laughs> So you have this, you know, in some ways it's, it's sweet, grainy, but then again you get this, you kind of get sick, and you get a bit nauseating when you smell it. So there's, there's definitely some niceness to it, but there's more, 
badness to it. So there's, it, this is a, this is a, there's no right answer for when you want to do the cuts between these different parts. Um, it's not bad to have a little bit of this like really rich oils, but if you get too much, it's gonna be it's gonna be nauseating. Uh, so, so you want the balance in there to have like a, a, a good spread of aromas to have your base for your whiskey, and that's going to interact with the wood during uh, maturation. Um, and now we'll just return to the way we distill this differently than anyone else because. If you went to Scotland or Ireland, they would tell you you have to distill two times or three times when you make your whiskey. But we only do it once. And the reason we can do this is this middle section. Um, so the first part, like the vapors are going through the pipe, they actually go down the back. I'm not sure you can see it. And they come out just behind the glass on the back of this tube. Now this tube is actually just more cover. It's like a corkscrew. <coughs> inside so the vapors has to go like this. It means that you have a lot of contact between the copper and the vapors and that's necessary to clean out the sulfuric compounds that can arise in distillation. So we don't really want those. So this is actually just, I mean you could have had a much much larger hat and you would get kind of the same result. This is just a way to uh, com you, you know, uh, compress this into a smaller uh, unit to get a lot of copper contact. So all the vapors have to go through this. Yes. There is no shortcut. No. So so they, they it can actually shortcut here, but it has to go through this. Yeah. Otherwise it goes up, mostly up. Yeah. And and it has to go this way up. So we're still on the way up. Okay. Um, then the top section is what's really different. That's what you call a purifier. In German it's called Diffleckmator, I think. And this is basically a condenser like, like, like the one here. Yeah. It's a bit uh, sh uh, narrow. We don't want it to be too efficient. And it's not full with cold water. You can see the temperature in the middle of it right now. That's 80 degrees. So it's quite hot water in there. And this means that this will actually act like a sieve. So the vapors are trying to push through. You can see the, the small holes for the pipes there. So the vapors are trying to push through. But um, there's water coming in all the time from the top of the condenser. In the top it's 20, 30 degrees, depends. So the, always a little bit of water is running in. So it will be a bit colder in the bottom, but warmer in the, in the, in the top. Um, and, and that will uh, keep some of the alcohols down uh, or some of the vapors down. So the water vapors will still condense at 80 degrees. Some of the heavier oils that has a higher boiling point than 100 degrees will still condense. And you see all the vapors dripping down right now. It's pushing all the way back into the pot again. So it means that the vapors coming through are much cleaner than they would be if you do just a, one single distillation straight into the uh, into the uh, condenser. But it sounds like it is a semi-continuous distilling process. Um, I'm not too sure uh, because if you have a if you have a real continuous distilling process, you actually normally put in the water from the top of the still and you will evaporate the different parts of uh, alcohols from the water before it actually hits, hits the bottom. So it's not a continuous distillation, it is a batch distillation. This, like if you go to Artbeck or a few others that I can't recall, they actually do have a purifier on their, on the top of their neck here, this one neck. It would just be up there, which is basically the same. Uh, but but I, I'm sure ours is much bigger compared to the pot. Mm -hmm. So this is a, 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 this is a strange hybrid of things because you normally have these. Um, if, if you want to do clean distillates, you have plates like in your in your still, and every plate actually uh, imitates a new evaporation and condensation because you have to pass the vapors through a small layer of condensated spirit. To, to move on to the next uh, to the next plate, but the yeah, thing it just looks like right? one of those typical continuous elements with the holes in and and yeah. dripping through ah, okay. the yeah. different floors. Because, but, but I think what happens in this in this um, in this strange setup here is that the vapors will always be created here in this pot, which is quite different from from a continuous distillation where you have the vapors created all the way through. Because these liquids are just running, you know, they will be moving downwards. And of course there will be some interaction with the vapors coming up and the liquid running down, but not so much. Mostly 
it will go to the pot and it will try to evaporate again. And every time you evaporate something from a, a pot of boiling beer, it will also bring those grainy beer aromas with it. This is where you collect those. So what we what we get with this, what we like, I wouldn't say we we knew a lot about this when we started out. We just started out with a system like this because the local distillery a guy who wanted to start a distillery, he had his eyes on this, and then we tried to experiment with it. But what we figured out was what actually happens is it brings a lot of that like malty, grainy aroma through. So if you do small changes in the beer, that will come through amazingly. So small changes here makes great changes in the, in the spirit. But if you do an, another distillation and another again, we try to do this as well here, like redistill, then many of those differences will be very much less. Like it could be like a, when you taste it, it could be something like, a, I would say it tastes like only, f only five or 10% of what was actually there or 20. So it's much, much less that you go through when you do this. Um, every time you go from, from, from liquid to vapor to liquid, it leaves behind some things. It doesn't mean it's not a good spirit coming out in the end. You know, it can be an amazing spirit, but this just brings a lot of that malty aroma through and that's the whole point of what we're doing that we want to experiment with different malts different barley varieties different grains and really see the difference in the end One thing I see, you do not do palletized. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why? We thought this uh, would be uh, easier for sampling every barrel. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't believe that you will get to sampling a big palletized warehouse mm -hmm. very much. So, but if you do large amounts, I mean, we, we would consider as well. Yeah. So if you did like uh, 200,000 liters of one thing in a year, I mean, why not mm. put it on pallets? Because you will not sample every cask anyways, I think. But we have so many different things that I would like uh, to be able to look much more inside every single cask. Um, last year we did eight, nine different recipes and, of new mix mm -hmm. and some of them variations. Um, and that went to many different barrels. So it's not just one or two or three combinations. It's maybe... Uh, 30 just for that year uh, mm. in the warehouse. So that takes a lot of work to to wrap your head around what's happening in every 30 variations from one year. Um, and when you add up the years, it's going to be complicated. So that's why we chose this. And probably you will not be stopped experimenting for a long time, will you? Um, it's going to be hard <laughs> because all the experiments that we did already will live for a decade or, or more, uh, maybe three decades, who knows? So we, we, we can't stop. Uh, we, we set this ship to sail and, uh, and we don't want to stop either. But there are some things that we are doing more, like focusing on, mm. yeah.